Hey, my name is Sean Sears. I'm the pastor here at Grace Church, and uh, if this is your first time here, I want to say thank you guys for coming. And for all of you that are here, I just want to say thanks. Anytime anybody shows up here at Grace Church, uh, we, we feel honored because we know that none of you guys were forced to be here, so thank you very much uh, for coming. Um, I wasn't here this past weekend. Taylor uh, did a fantastic job, and uh, Ken started this series uh, two weeks ago. Um, that we're taking a brief time out and really quick. It kind of fits along with the theme, uh, but wasn't, wasn't a planned part of, of this series. Uh, I was out of town last weekend because a friend of mine who pastors a church in Austin, Texas, uh, and was, was going to be on, on his anniversary trip with his wife. And so he said, hey, Sean, you want to fill in for me? And I said, yeah, why are you going to be gone? And he said, yeah, it's our anniversary. And I was like, that's awesome. It's our anniversary too. Uh, do you care if I bring my wife? And he's like, yeah, you know, I was going to suggest that. So he suggested me bringing Billy Jane. And, and I asked if we could go out a few days early so that we can make like a little, you know, romantic getaway out of it. And we, uh, we, we went to uh, uh, San Antonio. I've never seen the Alamo. It's one of those bucket list things things to do and, you know, the river walk that's there. And and if you've ever been to San Antonio, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That river walk is amazing. So if you're looking for a a getaway, I highly recommend San Antonio. It's, it's, It's awesome now. It's only an hour drive from Austin, which is where I was supposed to preach this weekend, but when he told me it was in Austin, uh, when it came back out a few days later and I was booking the plane tickets, I booked the plane tickets for, for Houston, so that's a typical thing to do, I guess. If you're in, I, I've heard I'm not the first person to book plane tickets out of Houston when trying to visit Austin. The only problem is that it's a three and a half hour drive away from San Antonio instead of an hour drive. So uh, I looked into changing the tickets and it, and it wasn't going to work. Well, we could have made it work. It would have just been a little bit, a little bit more than $1,100 to change. Now, I love my wife. I just don't, uh, I shouldn't say I don't love her that much. <laughs> of course, I love my wife that much. I, I just, I, 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 how about this? I, I, I wanted the $1,100 more than I didn't want to drive three and a half hours. And I'm thankful to God my wife agreed with me. So we kept our tickets the same. We rented a car. Uh, we got there uh, last, last Thursday and drove the three hours to the place that we were staying in San Antonio. And, and we stayed there for two nights, had a fantastic time. On, uh, then on Saturday, we drove up to uh, Austin and watched the bats come out of the, the bridge. And if you don't know what that's about, you can Google it. It was, it was a good time. And then I spoke at the church. Um, that, went, that was fun. I, I loved doing it. Their church was very friendly. And, uh, you know, I, I missed Grace uh, uh, being there instead of here last weekend, but um, it, it went really well. And I, and I know that Taylor did a fantastic job while I was gone. Uh, but as soon as the services were over, we had to hightail it back to Houston to catch our flight. So we didn't have time to go out to dinner with anybody after the services or nothing. We talked to a few people, hopped in the car and took off. And, and we, we barely made it. But in that, that three-hour drive, you know, I had nothing to do uh, but uh, play on Instagram and uh, Facebook. You know, read other things while you're driving, as we all do. Uh, and then I, I came across uh, uh, a post from a friend on Instagram. Uh, his name is Daniel, and he was a part of Grace Church when we sent out the team of people to start Encounter Church in Dedham. So he's been a part of Dedham, uh, the Encounter Church now, for like the last uh, two years. And uh, so, But we keep in contact. And, and what I thought I would do to share with you guys why I'm preaching this weekend, because I wasn't scheduled to preach this weekend, um, Brian Buford, Pastor Brian is supposed to be speaking, um, but we called an audible. And in fact, I'm not even recording this this weekend. Uh, I am right now talking to you late, late Monday night. It's actually one um, twenty-two a.m. Tuesday morning. And the only reason why I even share that with you is to impress on you the value of the issue that we're talking about uh, this weekend, uh, highlighted by this post from, from Daniel. So, uh, so last Sunday afternoon, uh, my friend Daniel put this on his Instagram account, and uh, Daniel said, and it's a repost from somebody else. I, I don't know who it's from, but he said this. He said, does it, does it bother you that these KKK with no mask will likely be in someone's church Sunday, singing worship songs, praying, attending a church plant conference, policing our neighborhoods and teaching our children? Is there not an outrage from white-led churches or organizations to go find these people and warn us who they are? Does not the Holy Spirit compel you to preach a message this weekend 
to convict their hearts and transform their minds, or are you still silent and complicit? As the white nationalist power base bears public witness and terrorizes the rest of us, where is the white-led resistance to this white-led terror? And as a, as, a, a, as a white guy who happens to be a pastor of a church, uh, I, um, obviously that, that catches my attention. It was, it was directed to me. I, I'm not saying Daniel posted that on his Instagram account for Sean. That's not what I'm saying at all. His, his comment to that after he posted it was simply, pretty good question. And then like a hmm emoji face. Um, so I, I pushed back a little bit and asked why he thought that there was, uh, why, why he thought that that came from, oh crud, I just lost it. Uh, why he thought that they were in, in a church. And uh, you're going to have to give me just a quick second because I, I lost that post. Um, here it is. Um, so my comment was, um, let me get to it really quick. Sorry about this. So I said, why would anyone assume that these jerks will be in church? Because at, at first, the, the assumption of that post was that, uh, does it bother you that these guys are all claiming to be Christians and they'll be at your church, they'll be at church planting conferences, that they were essentially uh, church leaders? And uh, m- m- that, wasn't, that wasn't my first thought. My first thought was that these are horrible people who have nothing, who have absolutely nothing to do with God and are in desperate need of, of a change from the inside out. So I, I said, why would anyone assume that these jerks will be in church? And his response is that the KKK claim to follow Christian values and some of them hide in churches, unfortunately. And while I believe that that's probably true, uh, it was the next comment that, that, um, that, that, that I struggled with. And, and somebody posted, yes, failure to see the correlation between American evangelical Christianity and white supremacy has haunted this nation for centuries. And, and that, man, I, that, that killed me, is that this person believes that there is a direct correlation between American evangelical Christianity and, and white supremacy. Now, I'm, I am not denying that the American church, the white brand of the American church is steeped in this country uh, in, in flavors of, of, of racism. I'm, I'm, I'm not denying that. What I struggled with was the assumption that there's a direct correlation between evangelical Christianity and, and white supremacy. Now, the truth is we, we may be operating from a different definition of terms, um, I, I, I don't use the word evangelical to describe Grace Church at all when talking to anybody about our church because of the way that word has been hijacked by political pundits to describe right-wing conservative Republican partisan politics. But the word evangelical isn't defined by that. The word evangelical actually means uh, somebody who gives others an opportunity to know and to follow Jesus. And, and that's consistent even in other uses of that word in other industries. So there's, there, there are Mac, uh, uh, like, like Apple uh, evangelists or, or uh, you know, Coca-Cola evangelists or, you know, the, you've heard the word e- evangelist outside of the Christian arena and anybody who would market themselves as any other type of evangelist is saying that they're the type of person who wants to give other people an opportunity to know and to follow their product. So the word evangelical means simply in its, in its truest historical uh, uh, definition just means that the kind of churches that are passionate about giving other people an opportunity to know and to follow Jesus. So if that is the definition of the term evangelical, to give other people, to desperately do whatever it takes to give the most people the best chance to know and to follow Jesus, then dang it, I'm an evangelical. If an evangelical is a hard wing, a hard line, right wing, tea party, uh, uh, Republican, then that isn't what God's calling us to be. That, that has nothing to do with what the church is about because Grace Church here, we, we don't talk about politics because as it concerns who you are in relationship to God, I, I, don't, get, I don't care like at all what party you are. I, like I, I don't think we should be distracted as a church by temporary American politics 
from what God's called us to do, which is more important, which is somebody's eternal destination. Where somebody spends eternity is far more important, important than who they're going to vote for in three years. So I, I know what I'm going to spend my time doing. And it's not going to get you to change your party affiliation. It's going to get you to change your heart. Because you can't change anybody by legislating sin out of them. You can only change them by giving them an opportunity to be made new, to, to be changed on the inside. And that's not going to come through legislation. That'll only come through transformation. And that only happens when God gets a hold of somebody. So we don't talk about those things, but I, I think they're operating out of the definition as it's used now, evangelical, that, 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 that church that's identified with with, with one political party, uh, typically in the South, that, that is identified more by their political party's platform than by the teachings of Jesus. So I'm, I'm allowing that difference. I'm allowing that as, as a possibility for this difference. But then the next person says, even if they are not in church, the message should be preached in, in every church. And, 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 and I'm just going to confess to you. By the way, if I say anything today that's my biggest fear in this is that I would say anything stupid. Uh, if you know me, you know that I'm, 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 not, I'm not a racist. I'm not prejudiced. But sometimes I, I'm ignorant and I'm, and I'm not woke, but I'm, I'm waking is, is probably the better definition of where I'm at. So the assumption that this should be talked about in every single church this weekend was not something that I, I thought uh, and, until yesterday. My thought was is our church obviously doesn't have this problem. Look around and you'll see um, people of every color. And we have, I don't know, a few dozen different nations represented here at Grace Church. So if this isn't a problem we struggle with here in this church family, why is this something that we should address here in this church family? That, that really was what, what I was thinking. Um, and, and then my response was, they are hateful bigots who share nothing with biblical Christianity and then I quoted the passage of Scripture where Paul says, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. And then I wrote, Can I add black or white? For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And then a few minutes later, I responded, Daniel, what values do they share with evangelical Christianity? Because I didn't want to address his friend that way. It was his friend who had posted that until we see that there's a correlation between evangelical Christianity and white supremacy, we're not going to get any better. I, I didn't want to go at, at his friend. I don't know the guy. And, but I knew that Daniel knew my heart and that I could address the question through him and, and it wouldn't appear to be, to be mean-spirited. So I said, Daniel, what values do they share with evangelical Christianity? I don't reject your pain uh, as a black man or their evil as racists. I reject the implication, though, that evangelical Christianity and racism go hand in hand. Somebody else who hadn't spoken yet jumps in and addresses me and says, saying that we are all one in Christ doesn't address the issue, though. We, the church, know that we are one. However, these bigots do not see it as such and will continue in their hateful ways. And the church preaches to the church about what's wrong, but the church hasn't done its job to bring truth to the world. The church has failed the black community. We've become complacent and have not drawn a line in our stance, and the church's silence comes off as a cosign. You have to address the fact that black people have always dealt with these behaviors, and now it's just becoming more apparent. The church chooses to sugarcoat issues by saying, we are all one. That's like saying, all lives matter. Then they said, understood. But black people, the one who are in your churches, do not feel safe. And they need you to stand with us regarding uh, regards to attacking these issues. We need you to stand with us. Please choose a side. Sorry. They have chosen to unite in hate. So please stand with us to combat it. The, the tenderness of that uh, person's response to my ignorance is what softened my heart toward the issue and made me feel like this is something we should definitely address. Sorry. 
Daniel responded back and said, they don't actually practice Christian values, but white supremacists often use the name of God to justify their actions. Christianity and racism do not go hand in hand, but the intent of the original post, in my opinion, is to raise the claim that to be silent is to be compliant. Our hearts break openly in church for those who are disconnected from Jesus, which is true. And then he said, but when a tragedy like Charlottesville takes place, and white leaders say nothing, it would seem that their hearts break a little less. And I have no defense to that because I think in part it's true. Because, I'm sorry. Because I have not lived the black experience it's easier for me not to notice the things that happen every single day. I've, I've never been followed through a grocery store because I was a white guy. I've never felt I was pulled over because I was a black guy in too nice of a car or in too nice of a, in too nice of a neighborhood. That's not happened to me. So I don't know that my radar is attuned to it, like, like, like some of you. And, and you're right, issues like this make it more apparent, and people whose radars are turned down, it even grabs our attention now. And what I'm trying to help us do as a church family is get on the same page and make sure that we are, are like some of us, I think, have the radar turned up too high. And, and some of us don't, don't, even have the, don't even have the radar plugged into the wall yet. So if we, can, if, if we can just find some middle ground as followers of Jesus and allow God's word to shape our opinions and our actions, I, I think that we can be a part of the solution rather than a part uh, of, the, of the problem. Um, there are a few other great comments uh, uh, in here that that I'm, I'm, for the sake of time, I'm, I'm not, not going to get to. Suffice it to say, though, that I feel like God used their responses to my question of the original post uh, to highlight something that I, I do feel we as a church uh, need to address. Um, it was Martin Luther King who said, I think it is one of the most shameful tragedies of our nation that 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in Christian America. The Christian church should be integrated. In any church that stands against integration, that has a segregated church body, is standing against the spirit and teachings of Jesus Christ. And, and he's right. Now, I, I'm not saying that if you are in a white church and you live in a white community that, that your church is against uh, the teachings or spirit of Jesus, or if that you're in a black church and you live in a black neighborhood that because you don't have white people, you're against the teachings or spirit of Jesus. I'm not saying that at all. And, and I don't know that that was, that was Martin Luther, Dr. King's intent either. If, if we have a culture that is not welcoming to people because of their race, we, we are in violation of the teaching and, and spirit of Jesus. I, I think that our churches should be a reflection of the community. So what does the community look like? And if we're doing a good job making Jesus accessible to the people who live closest to our physical locations, then our congregations should be an accurate representation of the demographics in the community in which we exist. But here we are 57 years after he said that. He said that April 17th, 1960. Here we are 57 years later, and, and I don't know that we've made, we've made much progress as, as, a, as a church body as a whole. Uh, as, as followers of Jesus here, here in this country. Um, I'm thankful to Jesus uh, that that isn't our particular experience here at Grace Church, um, and that's not by any intentional design. Uh, when Billy Jane and I felt like God was calling us to start Grace Church, it's not that we sat down and we said, you know, how can we get, um, you know, black and brown, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say, like I talked to a, uh, an Asian girl on our staff and said, am I allowed to say yellow? Because we say, we, say, we say white people, we say black people, we can say brown people, but I don't, I'm ignorant on that. I don't know if we're allowed to say yellow people. So, um, and we do have Asians in our church. So I, I, like I said, I don't want to 
sometimes I'm, ju I'm, just, I'm just ignorant. Any anyway, um, um, it, we didn't set out trying to fill a demographic quota. Uh, our close friends in, in Stoughton were our neighbors across the street and they're black. And so our, our closest friends in Stoughton who were black asked us to start a Bible study for a friend of theirs. And they kept inviting their friends. And so Grace Church has been integrated, uh, racially diverse since the very beginning. But the reason why Grace Church is diverse is because my own social network is diverse. Um, I think that anywhere in our country where desegregation can be legislated, it's been done. It is, it is illegal to discriminate based on race in areas like education and government and, and the workplace. But they can't legislate who you invite to your barbecue. They can't legislate who you hang out with for the Super Bowl. They can't, they can't legislate your social sphere of influence. And because we're still broken human beings on the inside, we still think in junior high terms of people like us versus, versus people who are not like us. And we clump uh, in similarities for, for safety, for, uh, uh, for common interest. And we make assumptions based on the way people look that we'll fit in with them or not. So because we are still socially segregated, our churches are, are segregated. You can't, uh, churches aren't a legal, in, they're, they're, they're social constructs. Uh, they're, they're not legislated constructs, so they reflect the social realities of, of, our, of our culture. If, if you are a pastor and you want your church to be diverse, then my first suggestion to you would be to, or would be to look at your own group of friends uh, uh, and to consider how diverse your own social circle is. If, if you don't have friends of another uh, racial demographic, then, then you're not going to reproduce that in your church family. Um, and it was because our closest friends were black that we were able to do that. And, and, and that isn't on any noble intention of ours. Uh, I was raised in a white church. If you're black, there's a good chance that you were raised in a black church. If you're Latino, there's a great chance you were raised in a Latino church, an Asian church, same, same thing. We're, 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 we're homogenous uh, socially, and so our, our churches are also. But when I was a kid, there was a, a black pastor from Chicago who came to our white church uh, to preach, and he found the, that one black family in our church, and he asked the, the father to stand up in the back of the room, and he asked the Latino father to stand up in that side of the room, and then the, the Asian dad to stand up, and you know, then the white dad to stand up in the other part of the room. And he said, for the sake of this illustration, I'm going to be Jesus, and I want each one of you to physically get closer to Jesus. And so they started walking closer to the aisle, and excuse me, walking closer to him as the pastor because he's the picture of Jesus. And, and then what he said is everybody gets closer, everybody gets closer, everybody gets closer. He says, keep coming, keep getting closer to Jesus, keep getting closer to Jesus. And as we all get right close to him, he says, all right, now reach out and grab my hand. Uh, reach out and grab my hand. And then he said, the closer you get to Jesus, the closer you get to each other. And that word picture made my brain pop. And I recognized the truth in what he was saying and then all of the different Bible verses that I had learned from the Hebrew scriptures and the Greek scriptures started popping into my head so that I began to see throughout all of history, God was interested in rescuing all people, that God, God doesn't play favorites. He's, he's not only interested, God's, God's, God's not a racist. And I know that some of the pushback, and that is in the Hebrew scriptures, God had called, called, called the Jews to wipe out entire populations of people. And so we look at that in genocide without recognizing uh, the historical truth that existed in their day. And that was that there was no governing rule of law, that there were tribal groups and that might made right. And that those groups that God had called uh, his people to displace had, were actively practicing human sacrifice. They were offering their children as living sacrifices in fire to demon gods. Bro, listen, that wasn't genocide. That was justice. That's what that was. And anybody, Jewish or not, who was willing to repent of their sin and turn to God was spared. That's, that was true throughout all of history in the Old Testament, and that's, that's, still, that's still true today. The thing I want to talk to is, is to those of us who, I want to say who are affected by this. This is all of us who are affected by this. I, I think we need to acknowledge that as a, as a white pastor, 
I, I think we need to acknowledge that the black church only exists in this country at least because the white church historically did not allow them to worship with them. This is true from the very beginning of our country. I'm right now reading a biography in the life of Washington by Ron Chernow. He's the guy who wrote uh, the book uh, Hamilton that they've got the play about that's like everybody's going crazy about. Uh, he wrote a biography in the life of, of Washington, and it's an, it's an incredibly long book. It's like 900 pages. I'm, I'm a nerd. I kind of like stuff like that. I'm on page 200, which means I'm only in chapter 5, but they've already gotten to the part where they, they've talked about his, his wealth and and, and the, the crazy thing about him to me is that he recognized the evil of slavery and also recognized his, his dependence on it for, for his wealth. And, and while he did treat his slaves better than most slave owners in his day, I, he doesn't get a pass for that, I'm just saying. I think it was that conflict in his heart that tempered his treatment it was on Sundays that he gave all of his slaves the day off to worship God, and he made comment about how they were free in their expression of worship towards God and that they worshiped differently, but they were allowed to do that because they weren't allowed to go to the white person's church. So since this divide on Sunday mornings was created historically in this country by white Christians, I think we're the ones who are in the best position to fix what we broke. The college I went to had a rule in its founding, the Bible college that I went to. The president of that Bible college was also my granddad's pastor when he came to faith in Jesus after World War II. And my grandfather, actually, his first ministry job was as the assistant pastor for this man. And I don't want to say his name because I'm not trying to dishonor his memory. And, but he had made this statement that no black person would ever be baptized in his church. And so since he was the founder of the college I went to, Obviously, I didn't know this when I went to that college. I only knew about it later on. But he had also said that no black person would ever graduate from the Bible college I went to. Now, I'm thankful to God that that sin was recognized, repented of, and that's not a true statement about that college anymore. But the sad thing is, is that my grandfather didn't, didn't say anything about that. And I know that the pushback is that it was a different time. But that's no excuse. If it's wrong now, it was wrong then. And if it needs to be repented of now, it needed to be repented of then. It's, it's always been wrong. The point I'm trying to make is that this divide that exists in our country was something that we as white people, those of us who are, not, not me personally, but the brokenness that exists how do I say this without being more divisive, is, was on, it's on us. And the only reason why I highlight the differences between white and black and saying it's, it's on us is that we're the ones who have to take the initiative to make it right. That, that's the only point I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make. But the truth is, is, while that's what the church looks like in America today, it is still the most segregated hour in our, in our country. It's not how the church was started. It's not what the first church looked like. Uh, in, in, in Acts chapter 8, you see the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. The dude was from Ethiopia. He was a servant of the queen of Ethiopia. He was an Ethiopian. The guy was black. And the Bible says that, he, that, that Philip was led by the Holy Spirit to go into the desert and, and wait on this man. God supernaturally led one of the apostles to go into the desert and wait just so that the black people in Africa would get an opportunity to turn from sin and follow Jesus. It's in the scriptures that before we get too far into anywhere else in Asia, God makes sure that those who are non-Jewish get an opportunity to know and to follow Jesus, and specifically Black people get an opportunity to know and to follow Jesus. And one of the most effective churches as far as accomplishing the mission of God was in Antioch. It wasn't in Jerusalem. It was in, it was in Antioch. Antioch was where they became very intentional about sending out people to make sure that everybody, everywhere, every language, every people group gets one opportunity to know and to follow Jesus. And one of the elders, one of the leaders, one of the pastors, one of the teachers in Antioch, this is in Acts chapter 13, verse 1, one of the elders, one of the pastors, one of the shepherds of the 
of, of the most effective church in that first century. His name was Simon the Black Man. <laughs> that, was, that was his nickname. It wasn't a derogatory thing. It, race is the color of somebody's skin. Is, is hardly, and there are black people in the, in the Old Testament uh, and in the New Testament, and the color of their skin is never, never emphasized because it was never a barrier. We now, we're the ones who, who, who artificially exaggerate that, that difference between people because God only created one kind of mankind, and that's humankind. That's, there's one kind. There's, that, that's, that's it. The, the color that we have has nothing to do with the image that we bear of God in, in, in our lives, and they recognize that. So, there, there, were, there, were, there were Jewish people, there were non-Jewish people, there were, there were brown people, there were white people, and there were black people who all shared leadership in the first century, in the first century church. The, the truth is, three of the most recognizable names in church history were all black. You, you may have heard of Augustine, uh, Tertullian, and Origen, and, and while the paintings of them that you see that have survived history were painted by artists who were European who made all of these guys white, no one of those three guys were white. They were all African, born to African parents. Not necessarily sub-Saharan Africa, but definitely African. They, they, they were, if they showed up in this building, you would immediately identify them as a black person. And, and they significantly changed the world, and God used them in significant ways. Um, in fact, it was uh, um, uh, Augustine's uh, autobiography up to his 40th year, his story of coming to faith in Jesus and his defense of the gospel, of uh, the story, the, the, the narrative of what Jesus had done and its impact in him that became the basis for all of the writers of the Reformation. If you're not familiar with Reformation, I'm talking about like Martin Luther and John Huss and John Calvin. All of these guys were heavily influenced by a black early church father, uh, Tertullian. He's the first one who ever used the word Trinity to summarize the existence of God as revealed in Scripture. We didn't have a word to define that there is one God who exists uh, as God, as spirit, and as word. And there is one God who exists uh, in a plural relationship. Tertullian, when, every time we use the word to Tertullian, that came from one of the black early church fathers, an, an African. And, and Origen was probably one of the most well-traveled early church fathers who went all around the Mediterranean and collected writings in the early uh, uh, 200s uh, from all of the different churches in the area of which letters, which, which uh, uh, letters from the apostles had been in existence and had been passed down for multiple generations. And there was a guy named Eusebius who used the list that Origen made at the Council of Nicaea to compile the New Testament to ensure its protection against the forgeries that had been introduced uh, throughout the Roman, Roman Empire. What I'm telling you right now is that the, the reason why we have the New Testament is because of one of the black followers of Jesus that God used to preserve his word for all of mankind. So those racists who use the Bible as a defense of their racism are banking their faith on something that God used a black man to preserve. What I'm saying is that it has no basis in truth. The scriptures do not support racism in any way, and God has always been for all the nations. That's why God said to Abraham in his very first conversation to him, if you follow me, then through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And the prophets continually said that when the Messiah showed up, he would be a light to the Jews and to the Gentiles. God is not a racist and does not play favorites. That's us. And that's the brokenness in us that needs to be repented of, forgiven, and put back together more in line with the character and nature of Jesus. So what are we to do? How should I actually respond to Charlottesville? Like, like, what do we do with this? I've spent all of this time defining the problem and showing how it isn't consistent with, with the scriptures or with church history. How are we to respond? And what I want us to do for the rest of our time is to look at the Bible and to see what it says about the way we should respond. So in, in, in 1 Peter 
chapter one, I'm gonna start reading in, in verse 13 uh, through, through 18, and here's what he says. Uh, so think clearly and exercise self-control. Look forward to the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So what I want you to do is I want you to be careful of how you act. I want you to focus on Jesus Christ, your relationship with him, and the fact that other people are gonna eventually know who he is. Verse 14, so you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, and the implication is, but you should know better now. Now, here's the thing. He he didn't write this to a church that didn't have any problems. When the apostle Peter wrote this letter to the church at large, it was after Nero had already blamed Christians for the burning of Rome. They were being tortured to death throughout the Roman Empire and they were being hunted down. They were persecuted people and they were an oppressed people. The natural tendency was to fight fire with fire. He said, if they poke me in the eye, I'm gonna poke them in both of their eyes. And the Apostle Peter is writing to caution them and their response, to recognize that there's something bigger happening here than just your rights being violated. There's something more at stake than just the injustice of their mistreatment. There's something spiritually happening here. There will be a time when God is revealed to the entire world and all that is wrong will be set right. In light of that, you make sure that you live differently in the world. Don't do what they do. You are to be set apart. The next phrase he says is that we are to be holy. Don't slip back into your old ways. You didn't know any better then, verse 15. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. You're to be set apart. You're to be different. You're to love in ways that other people aren't loving right now. You are to forgive people that other people would not forgive. You are to serve people who don't deserve to be served. And you are to give more of yourself than what they have earned from you. That's what he says. He told those who were being persecuted, you know how to make a difference? The way I want you to make a difference is to respond differently. Why are we to do this? They don't deserve it. You're right, they don't deserve it. But you're to respond that way because God responded that way to you. Do you deserve to be forgiven by God? No. Then do they? No. But did he forgive you? Yes. Then should you forgive them? Yes. That's the point he's trying to make. You do this. Why? Because God is holy. You love the unlovable because God has loved the unlovable. You forgive the unforgivable because God has has forgiven the unforgivable. That's why he's asking us to do these things. You're to live differently, but that doesn't come naturally to us. It's unbelievably difficult. The normal thing to do is what everybody else is doing is to fight fire with fire. They're protesting, then you protest. If they get violent, then you get violent. Fight fire with fire. The the, the scriptures acknowledge that that's going to be our natural response. Galatians chapter 5 talks about that. And this is a passage of scripture that that, that Pastor Ken introduced to us at the beginning of this series. But in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 to 21, he says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide the way you live your lives. Don't, Don't do just what comes natural. Let God's Spirit guide the way you respond. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do what is evil. We want to fight fire with fire. We want, man, if they punch us, we want to punch them back. But that's the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other in my heart. And don't you feel that? Like I often feel like but my natural, like, 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 like if I feel that I've, I've, been, I've been done wrong, that my, my natural response is to, and sometimes I follow that and then instantly there's regret and remorse and, and conviction over that. And that's, that's that war that's happening in my heart between my natural inclination and God's, God's presence in my life trying to conform me into the likeness of, of Jesus. He says, but when you are directed by the Spirit, in verse 18, you're not under obligation to the law of of, of, of Moses. Verse 19, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are this. How can I tell if I'm following the desires of my sinful nature? Here's what will happen. My lifestyle will be demonstrated by my sexual immorality, my impurity, my lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, fighting, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, and division. Envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. But let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
Paul says right there, right off the bat, those who live like that have nothing to do with God. We're to choose a different path. We're to choose a narrower path. Jesus talked about it. There's a wide path that leads to destruction. There's a narrow path that doesn't. And he says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. And this is a narrower path where we are to love the unlovely, to have joy in the middle of sorrow, to have peace in the middle of conflict, to have patience in the middle of aggravation, to be kind in the middle of their rudeness, to be good even when others are selfish, and to be faithful even when others have betrayed us, to be gentle when others are rough, and to have self-control when everything in me wants to rage against everything outside of me. That is the evidence of what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. So when somebody says that they're a Christian and they do that, they're not who they say they are. Somebody who does this is. But how do I get there? Jesus said that the only way that you'll get here, the only way that you'll follow in his ways, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24 is this, is to turn, anybody who wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways. What do you think it meant when he said turn from your selfish ways? It's our natural instinct. I'm to turn from my natural instinct. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, I want you to turn from your self-serving ways. I want you to get over you. Now, now stop for just a second because it's easy for me to say, but what that means is that sometimes I allow other people to take advantage of me. And it's me not fighting fire with fire that puts the fire out. Martin Luther King knew that. He knew that it was that peaceful resistance that was going to demonstrate the righteousness of the cause that would change the heart of the people. He's echoing the words of Jesus. If you want to follow me, you must turn from your selfish ways. You must take up your cross, he says. That means to live a life of sacrifice, meaning not my will be done, but God's will be done. Jesus offered his life as a living sacrifice, as a sacrifice to me, and I'm to offer my life as a living sacrifice back. And then he says, and then actually follow me. To live like I live, to love people the way I loved people, to give to people like I gave, and to serve selflessly like I served. What is that tan okay, which sounds great, but how do I get this started and what does it look like? And I think and we're gonna spend some time looking at what Paul said. Paul said in Philippians chapter three. Verse 5 through 11, Paul said, and he's bragging about his, his racial heritage. He says, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel. I'm a member of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, Benjamin. Uh, I'm a Hebrew if there ever was one. I mean, this, this dude's just going through all the checklists. I'm, I'm a pure blood. I don't have any mixed race in me. I'm, I'm strict. I keep the rules. I'm disciplined. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so jealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. Paul says, you know what? This, this is what I thought was important. And I let my race define who I was. I let my cultural identity define the way that I lived my life. Paul was so wrapped up in this. He was full of, listen, this dude was full of hate. And here's what happened. Verse 7, I once thought that these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless. Why? Why do I consider my racial identity worthless? Because of what Jesus did for me. That's what changes everything. It's my recognition that Jesus willingly allowed himself to be sacrificed that gives me the ability to willingly sacrifice my will for his he goes on to say, yes, everything else is worthless with, when compared with the infinite value of knowing Jesus is my Lord. For, this sake, I, for his sake, I have discarded everything else. I count it all as garbage. Why? So that I could gain Jesus. So I can be one with God. So I can be on the same page with God. I'm no longer defined by these things. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Jesus for God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith is what he says. He says, I count all of these things as garbage. And then he says in verse 15, 
Let all who are spiritually mature and agree on these things. And if you disagree on some point, I believe God will change your mind. <laughs> I love that. He said, I, I used to define myself by my racial demographic. I used to define myself by my observance of, of my religious heritage. I, I, I saw my identity through the lens of culture is what I did. But I willingly let go of who I used to think of myself so that I could grab on to Jesus. And if any of you don't think the way I think about this, I'm convinced it's only a matter of time before you become mature enough that God will change your mind on this. And it was because of that that Paul was able to say in Romans chapter 13, verse 12 through 14, he said, the night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So Remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. He says, take off who you used to be and put on something different. Verse 13, because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity or in immoral living or in fighting and in jealousy. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. He says, the way that this actually happens and the way that we live of our lives is that I make a conscious choice to reject the person I was before coming to faith in Jesus. This means that I let go of who I saw myself to be before Christ. And now I identify, number one, as a follower of Jesus. I make a conscious choice to take off my cultural identity. I make a conscious choice to take off my social identity. I make, it, make a conscious choice to take off my political identity, my racial identity, anything else that I view myself as other than as a follower of Jesus. He said, I am a Jew and I willingly take this off and I count all of that as worthless for one reason, so that I can constantly and on a daily basis choose to identify, number one in my life, I am a follower of Jesus. So I respond to my wife, not as a husband, but as a follower of Jesus. And that makes me a better husband. I respond to my kids as a follower of Jesus. I live in relationship with my neighbors as a follower of Jesus. I respond to people's hate as a follower of Jesus. Everything I do is as a follower of Jesus. My number one identifier is that I am a follower of Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus before I am anything else. In fact, everything else I am is submitted to that identity right there. I am a follower of Jesus. I submit every area of who I am. This means that I'm biblically centered. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not politically centered. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, number one, a, 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 a Republican or, or a Democrat. And listen, I don't care which side of the aisle you're on, but dear God in heaven, don't let your political party shape your values. You as a devoted follower of Jesus have got to let God's word shape your values. And the truth is, if you're a devoted follower of Jesus and this book shapes your values, you will not agree with everything on the Republican side and you will not agree with everything on the Democratic side because you're not for Republicans, you're not for Democrats, you're for Jesus and everybody you know getting at least one chance to know and to follow him. And that drives everything you do as a Republican or as a Democrat. I am a follower of Jesus. That's what I am. I will live and die as a follower of Jesus. I'm not identified as a white man. Maybe to you, you see me that way, but I will not respond that way. I will respond as a devoted follower of Jesus. So I will do what Jesus would do in this situation. And when I don't, I'm at odds with God's spirit in my heart. That's when I'm giving in to my flesh. And that's what Paul says, that's, that's the fight that's going on. I've got to make a conscious choice to put on Jesus instead of that. So, what, so, so, so that I can, why, why would I do this? So that I can actually affect change. And the last verse that we're looking up is in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 to 22. Paul says, even though I am a free man with no master, I have chosen to become a slave to all people. Why? To bring as many of them as possible to faith in Jesus. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. Even though I'm not subject to that law, I did this. Why? So that I could bring to Christ those who were under the law. When I'm with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. It's not that I'm ignoring the law of God. I, I obey the law of Christ, though. When I'm with those who are weak, I share their weakness. 
For I want, why? Because I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone. Listen to this. Doing everything I can to save some. Verse 23 goes on to say, I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. You know what I'm to do? I'm to choose to serve. Who is God calling me to serve? Who do you not want to serve? That's the question. Who do you find it hardest in your heart to love? Regardless of your race. Who do you find it hardest to be around? Who do you find it hardest to be kind to? There's a guy who was asked by Jesus, who is my neighbor? You know who Jesus picked? He picked the racially mixed guy as the hero of that story. So we have the story of the Good Samaritan. We name hospitals after that guy. And Jesus picked someone that the asker of the question would have considered racially inferior to make the hero of the story, to show him that those who follow me are able to love those that they find unlovable. Why? Because I loved you and you were unlovable. They forgive those who've done unforgivable things. Why? Because I forgave you for unforgivable things. So what should we do about this? I'm going to give you four things you need to do. Number one is you need to repent of every sin and division in your heart. You need to catch yourself saying things that are divisive. I didn't understand the whole black lives matter versus all lives matter until there's a girl in our youth group. And I, I learned about it before, but it was highlighted again last night. At youth group, there's a ninth grade girl in our, she's eighth grader going into ninth grade who was talking to Shanika about this child. She was talking about the reason why it's so hard for her to hear people say all lives matter. She said, it's like going to the doctor with a broken arm and your doctor saying, well, all bones are important. Let me fix your leg. But your leg isn't the bone that's broken. Your arm is. And so for those of us who are white, when someone says black lives matter, and I'm not trying to get political with this, I'm trying to help you recognize ways that we're unintentionally divisive. So when we say all lives matter, while that is a true statement, it diminishes the fact that some people live lives that are a little bit harder than others. That's all. Recognize the people in your life that you have a hard time with. Recognize and catch the things that you say that are racially insensitive. And God forbid if there's any ill will in your heart towards anybody else or insensitivity, dear God in heaven, let you recognize that for what it is and ask God to forgive you of it. Two, recognize that every person you see bears the broken image of God and know that God wants his image restored in them. Every person you've seen on the internet this past week throwing a, throwing a punch, that person bears the broken image of God in their life, and it is God's will that that person turns from sin, repents of it, and comes to faith in God. Number three, resist the urge to let somebody else be the person who helps them come to faith. Resist the urge to walk on the other side of the road and ignore the broken person in the ditch. The abuser, the um, person who's committed the injustice, they bear the broken image of God in their life, and you noticed it. And since you're the one who noticed their brokenness, it's highly probable that you're the person God's called to help represent him to them and to love them in the middle of their unloveliness, to be kind in the middle of their Meanness. Number four, to reject sin's blurring stain wherever you see it. Don't let it stand uncontested. I've got a family member who isn't a racist, but who is very ignorant and says things that are highly inappropriate without any hatred or malice, but it genuinely comes from a place of ignorance. And my wife and I came to a place where we made a determination that if they were going to say that in front of our children ever again, we were going to confront it because it wasn't good enough that I wasn't saying those things. It was bad that I was allowing that to be said in front of me and I didn't address it. But do it in the way that you would for any other sin. If somebody's living a lifestyle that is inconsistent with Scripture, we don't hate on them for it. 
regardless of what sin it is. Sin it is. So if you feel you need to say something to somebody who said something that's inappropriate, make sure you do it with the same tenderness and compassion that you would say to them if they had asked your opinion about another area of sin and brokenness in their life. The point I'm trying to make is that if we're going to make any difference at all in this, through this, the first difference that has to be made is in us first. So I'm going to ask everybody, if you would, to bow your head. God, I'm thankful for the opportunity to be a part of this church family, and I'm thankful for the makeup of this church. I'm thankful for the way that you put this church together. I'm thankful for every part and every piece of this local body of Jesus, and I'm thankful for the way that our relationship with you shapes our relationship with each other. I believe, God, that the church is the hope of the world, but God, I believe that what happens in this building has got to start happening outside of this building. And while we're not going to make all of the change in the world, God, if we can change the way we treat one person and that person changes the way they treat one person, then God, maybe at some point we could be a part of what you're doing in all of the other churches and all of the other communities around us. But God, we've got to do our part. That's what I'm asking you to do. Show us where there's hatred, bigotry, ignorance, or racism in our own heart. Help us to confess it and make it right. I ask this in the name of your son, Jesus, and pray it in your name, and we all say together, amen.